to the Monthly Dirt Cast. I'm Jared Gillian, editor and publisher of the Daily Dirt Nap, a financial newsletter for investment professionals. Got a big surprise for you today. If you're like me, you're really interested in business, any kind of business, and you spend a lot of time trying to figure out how the revenue model works for just about anything from an airline to a lemonade stand. Also, if you're like me, you're fascinated by the business of professional sports. Now, most pro sports leagues have been demystified by media coverage. If you think about how a book like Moneyball lets you look behind the curtain of Major League Baseball. But nobody ever really thinks about what the business of professional sports is like at the minor league level. Minor League Baseball is one of life's great pleasures. I personally am a big consumer of the product. I'm a baseball junkie, but I also like seeing the game in a low-pressure environment where the tickets are $15 and you don't have to show up two hours early just to find a parking spot. The games are faster, the egos are smaller, and it's really baseball how it's meant to be played. But have you ever wondered about the economics behind minor league baseball, how those teams make money? We're about to find out today. I have with me Andy Milovich, general manager of the Myrtle Beach Pelicans. Welcome to the show, Andy. Hey, Jared. So just some basic questions first about your background. Uh, Where are you from? I grew up in South Bend, Indiana. I grew up in a baseball family, going to the ballpark every day with my dad and played as long as I could up through college and um, quickly found out in college that my playing playing days were going to come to an end. And um, uh, if I wanted to stay in baseball, the the business route was a way for me to do so. Well, talk about, um, you know, all right, so I played baseball when I was younger too, but you seem to be a pretty athletic guy. I'm not an athletic guy. I'm very uncoordinated. Uh, I was a pitcher, and I just got to a point where I was about age 14 or 15, and I couldn't throw any harder, and I just kind of reached my limit, and I had to give up the game. What was it like for you? Well, I, you know, um, I, I was a, a, a pretty good player through Little League, through high school, had some opportunities to play in college. I went to Valparaiso University, and um, – we had a, a fall league tournament, uh, I believe it was my junior year, um, down at Ball State University, and there was the University of Cincinnati, Xavier, Ball State, and Valparaiso. So clearly one of those teams doesn't belong, uh, which would be us, and um, uh, we wound up winning all three games in this round-robin tournament, and uh, I had the weekend of my life, went 11 for 12 in three games. That's <laughs> And there was a Philly scout at the time, Scott Turka, I believe he's with the Padres now, who came up to our coach after the game and said, yeah, your third baseman can hit a little bit, but holy beep, is he slow. And I thought, you know, I just played the best weekend I'm ever going to play. And the takeaway was, wow, is he slow. So that was a knock on you as you were too slow. (laughs) Yeah, I was slow, did hit for a lot of power, wasn't a great defensive player, could hit line drives, and those guys are a dime a dozen. So um, the business side of it was, uh, was where I found my niche. So did you major in sports management there? I did. I was a, uh, I was a business major at the time, and uh, I added uh, I had an extra year of eligibility from having redshirted. And um, so I, I picked up a degree both in business administration and sports management and uh, went to grad school, got a master's degree in sports management as well, and uh, did a couple of internships, got my foot in the door, went to the winter meetings in 93, uh, interviewed with probably 25 different teams, got a couple offers, and uh, got my start in 94. So you've been with the Pelicans for how long? This is my fifth season. Fifth season, okay. So let's talk about the business of how running a minor league teams work. Now, first of all, people should know that being a general manager at the minor league level is very different than being a general manager at the major league level. Explain that. Yeah, so we have um, what's called a, a PDC, a player development contract with the major league team. And our uh, role in the player development system is really to, to make sure they have all the tools and resources they need to develop. Uh, years ago, the major league clubs owned all of their minor league teams. Um, minor league baseball was small. The facilities were run down. Support wasn't great. And their interest, um, frankly, was was on developing players. And so... Once they, they realized that they could um, sell the rights to the franchise but, but partner with teams in, and provide players and coaches, it saved the big league teams money and headaches and allowed them to focus on their primary goals, which was to develop talent for the major league team. So a couple things. So first of all, this is a much better system. I actually didn't know that the major league teams used to own 
the minor league teams. And as you said, now they're independently owned. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. And, and there's As actually about, like what year did that happen? Uh, I, I would say in the in the seventies, the oh, major so league teams ago. started to unload the teams. There, yeah. there weren't many teams that were making money, and um, uh, minor league teams were often given away for the debt. If somebody wanted to assume the debts from a team in the late seventies, early eighties, you could sometimes pick up a franchise without even writing a check, um, just absorbing the losses from the year before. So, but as a general manager for the Pelicans, for example, Theo Epstein care he spends ninety percent of his time on players. Yes, and you spend ninety percent of your time on the business side. Correct. So the business of the ballpark is just like anything else; it's revenues and expenses. Yes, essentially, we are in a lot of ways like a movie theater. I don't control the show that goes out there on the field. I'm not responsible for signing players, coaching, or developing players. Um, I hope that we have a good team. We do everything we can to, to, to help them get better. But my primary responsibilities are the business and everything off of the field. So um, selling tickets, selling sponsorships, um, uh, cleaning the ballpark, providing the food and beverage service, the merchandise, um, the stadium operations, hiring the grounds crew, everything that goes on that doesn't involve the players and the coaches, I'm directly responsible for. And then from a player development standpoint, we do have to make sure that we meet the requirements of the uh, professional baseball agreement. Okay, so uh, you're not responsible for the players' salaries then, are you? No, we're, we're responsible for everything that goes on off of the field. We pay a uh, ticket tax to Major League Baseball based on our ticket revenues, and that money gets dispersed amongst the Major League teams to help offset the costs. And then there's a, a an expense-sharing side of it where the bats and the balls are shared, the cost of uniforms and transportation and hotel rooms are the responsibility of the Pelican staff, and um, the uh, the umpires are covered by the league and the Pelicans with their league dues. So uh, the on-field personnel, the signing bonuses, the managers and the coaches, uh, that's all the responsibility of our major league affiliates. So let's talk about this ticket tax. So your field-level seats are $15, right? Correct. Okay. So how much of that goes to Major League Baseball? I believe the percentage, which is it's escalating over uh, a period of five years, I believe. I believe right now it's a 10.5% uh, ticket tax to Major League Baseball. So basically you get 1350 Yeah, and then we pay sales tax and amusement tax based on your local and state laws as well. Right, so the, you, that's kind of like on a net basis because you're not applying sales tax to the ticket price. So that comes out of that. So you're really looking at... 12 something out of a $15 ticket. Correct. Yeah, about a about t- little over 20% of our ticket um, goes to various taxes, whether it's Major League Baseball or your local and state governments. Now, one thing I think people want to know about is they've heard that uh, minor league baseball salaries are very low. Um, and I think we'd like to know just, you know, exactly what they are. So can you give us a sense of, you know, I mean, the guys on the Pelicans, this is, and we didn't say this from the beginning, but this is the advanced A league that you're in, the Carolina league. So it's single A ball. What, what, what are these guys getting paid at the single A level? So the the contracts are, are, standard for the most part, um, unless somebody has been signed and added to the 40-man roster like a Bryce Harper. But there's one of those guys every five or ten years. Um, basically, the standard the, the standard salaries are set based on the years of service and the level of classification. So a, a guy at this level is probably making somewhere between $1,200 and $1,400 a month. Uh, he also gets $25 a day meal money when they go on the road. Um, and, and that's standard. Might be a little higher, a little lower based on the, the service time you have with your major league team and, uh, and your classification. But um, the, the pay isn't great. What really separates yeah, so, it, and, and they don't get paid year round. They just get paid while the season's going on. They get on, paid right? while the season is going on, correct. Yeah. And, um, but, but what they also get is they get signing bonuses based upon where they were drafted, whether or not they were signed as a free agent. So you have some guys on our team that likely had a signing bonus of $5,000. For signing their contract. And you have some other guys on our team. Uh, Eddie Martinez, I believe, signed his contract. He was a Cuban defector for $3.7 million. So the salary and compensation levels are kind of all over the board. And um, so you have some guys who are working part-time jobs or working in, you know, working in the winters trying to make ends meet. 
and you have other guys who are legitimately millionaires. Now, does that like create any tension like within the clubhouse or anything? No, it, it generally doesn't. Um, I think the guys that get the larger signing bonuses are are fairly respectful of the other guys and understand that not everybody's in the same place. Um, at the end of the day, the season is a grind for these guys. So they really come together. They spend a lot of time together on the bus, in the clubhouse, on the field. And um, the, 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 the experience that I've had is that it really doesn't play into it too much. So let's go back to the, the business side of it again. Um, so you're trying, your job is to get as many po- people in the ballpark as you can. That's the revenue side. Exactly. So you've been, I, I know for a fact that you personally have been pretty successful in increasing attendance over the last four or five years. Tell us how you did that. Well, I think w- when I got here, I, w- I was pretty fortunate that we have an incredible staff. We have a, a great ballpark, a great community. And it was 10 weeks before opening day. So there really wasn't much of an opportunity for me to come in and try to put my own stamp on it. And given the uniqueness of this market with 18 million tourists a year, um, a local community that's largely comprised of transplants that don't have a connection to the community beyond the desire to live somewhere where taxes are low, housing is affordable, and the weather is warm. Uh, So rather than come in and make wholesale changes is something that I really truly didn't know, I was forced to kind of go with what we had. And I think uh, there were two things that we really tried to embrace that first year I was here given the fact that our marketing budget was allocated, our promotional uh, schedule was was planned and, and spent, and our staff was in place. And the first was creating a campaign around our 15th anniversary season. You hear a lot of talk, especially since um, the financial collapse, about companies and how they spend their money, how they invest, how they market themselves. And in the sports industry, uh, it, it was no longer... Um, it was no longer desirable just to slap your name on a giant sign on the scoreboard. And, and our corporate partners, whether you're talking at the major league or NFL level or, or in minor league sports, really were looking for something that had a really strong social and community component to it. And uh, that's been the trend since then, as, as people look for ways to um, market themselves, but do so in a socially responsible way. And uh, do, do it in a way that engages the community and engages their employees and engages uh, uh, the, the sports property. And so we created our 15th anniversary season. It was 15 seasons of making a splash. We challenged ourselves to do over $250,000 in community givebacks. And um, we had never tracked everything we did. We set up a, a program where we, we tracked our community service hours. We valued those at $10 an hour. We tracked our direct donations. We tracked the fundraising proceeds from the different projects we were involved uh, in the ballpark. And we tracked our in-kind services if we donated the facility to the March of Dimes for Walk for Babies. And at the end of the year, uh, we, we raised uh, $397,000 for you know the community during the course of our 15th anniversary season. And um, that has been a huge component in how we have gone about engaging the community and developing fans and getting them to buy into what we're doing. And it also has led to some really favorable relationships with people as we've aligned ourselves with different charities in the community. We've gotten to know the people that sit on those charities boards, which are typically business leaders in the community. So it's created a lot of synergy that way. And the other thing that we really tried to focus on was data. You hear a lot about analytics. You hear about it in Moneyball. You live it every day. Uh, We were looking for ways to make better decisions, smarter decisions, and understand who our fans were and where they were coming from. And so that's had a big impact on how we schedule and the different things we do. But to touch back on the, the, uh, the social capital aspect of things again, we, um, we bought our Scarborough data when I got here in 2013. And it indicated that we had 50,400 unique fans, 18 and older, from Orier, Georgetown County, that came through our ballpark in 2012. So that's independent data from the people from Nielsen and Arbitron that told us how many fans locally came to our park. In 2013, following that season, we purchased the data again, and the only change that we had made was this uh, Play It Forward campaign to give back to the community, and the data showed that we had gone up to 63,000 local adults, 18 and older, in Ori and Georgetown County. So a 26% lift in people coming to our ballpark with a schedule that was virtually identical, a promotional schedule and marketing plan that was identical, and a staff that was completely in place. 
uh, which really demonstrates the power of giving and the power of being engaged at a grassroots level in your community. So ticket revenues as a percentage of your revenues is half, uh, 60%, 40%? Ticket revenues for us are about 40% of our revenue. And so, I mean, that's a, for a major league team, it's much, much less, I assume, right? Like for a major league team, it's TV revenues are the biggest driver. Is that right? Yeah, I, I think at the big league level, TV revenue is number one. I think... Uh, Local media and radio revenue is number two. Uh, and then you get into the ticket revenue and, and everything else that they're doing. So let's get an idea of like how big of a business this is. Now, I know you can't give me specific revenue numbers, but just tell me how many full-time employees that you have. We employ 20 full-time people. We'll have in the neighborhood of 15 interns annually. And there's about 200 other employees that are engaged in the ballpark throughout the season on a nightly basis. So that includes food service people, uh, volunteers, some of the old folks that come and that do usher duties and stuff like that. Yeah, it's it's ushers, it's cleanup personnel, it's ticket sellers, ticket takers, uh, it is grounds crew, uh, it's public address announcers, people running the video camera and production room. We probably employ six people that just operate cameras for our TV broadcasts that take place in-house. So, so now Myrtle Beach is a pretty good place to have a minor league baseball team because, I mean, you know, tens of thousands of tourists come through here every weekend. A lot of them want to see a game. And it's been my experience. I've been going to games for seven years. I go to about 20 games a year. And, I, I mean, i got to be honest, like, you know, there's a lot more tourists than locals. And I have to wonder, how does a team in a really small market, how do they stay profitable? I mean, we talked about this before, like a Bowie's Creek or, you know, Lynchburg. Lynchburg is not a small town. Like, how is how is their business work? How do they make that work? Well, I, I think there's, um, I've heard people say that a third of the teams make money, a third of the teams break even, and a third of the teams lose money. The Bowie's Creek is, uh, is there temporarily. They're owned by the Houston Astros, whose top priority is developing players. So they purchased a franchise. I think they spent the neighborhood of $13 million to buy a franchise to put into this league. And their primary goal and their desire to get into this league was to find a great place to develop talent. There's some issues in the California League. There's some teams there that they had in ballpark facilities that just did not meet the standards and made it really, really difficult to develop players. So, Wait, well, we, we talked a little bit about that. I mean, the California League, you said, was kind of a mess just because of the physical conditions that people were playing in, the wind, uh, smoke from forest fires, stuff like that. Yeah, it, it, there were two teams in particular, High Desert and Bakersfield, and every year or every two years, it happens in even-numbered years, the affiliation game begins, and teams that want to switch partners can switch partners. So we could seek to look for a new major league affiliate. A major league partner could seek a new affiliation and a new minor league team. And every two years, the last two teams, if it were a cakewalk, <laughs> get stuck out in high desert in Bakersfield in two places where, quite frankly, careers go to die. Um, the winds blow out. The, the conditions um, are insane. And so if the wind's blowing out, obviously lots of home runs, and you do not want to be a pitcher there. I mean, it's kind of like pitching for the Rockies in the 90s, right? It, it, exactly. They, without the, without the humidor, uh, yeah. humidifier or whatever room they put that in. So, so they literally have earned run averages as a team of seven and a half, eight. And guys who are prospects are going in there and just being decimated mentally. And, and trying to make changes to their approach and how so they the, pitch. So the and, Carolina League is like a much better place to play, right? Yeah, this is the league if there is um, in, in high A. And, and the reason it is is we, we have great facilities. We're in good markets. Uh, generally, our teams draw well, so you're playing in front of fans. And as from a player development side, you, you want your guys to get used to playing in those intense environments with big crowds. So in the Florida State League, they have nice facilities. Yeah, I mean, playing, you know, the Pelicans games are a bit like a double-A or triple-A game. Like, actually, I haven't been to a lot of triple-A games, but I went to see the Memphis Redbirds a couple years ago. And that's a stadium that seats 10,000 people, and there are maybe 500 people in the stands. You go to see the Pelicans on any given night, and there's four or 5,000 people in the crowd. Yeah, there's, uh, we, we do really well from a crowd standpoint. Our fans are engaged because a lot of them are retired or here on vacation, so they're looking to have a good time and, and they're engaged in what we're doing. And um, it, it's a great atmosphere to develop players. So when the last round of PDCs ended, our contract with the Rangers uh, was up, 
and there were seven teams uh, whose affiliation agreements had expired. All seven teams expressed a desire to come to Myrtle Beach. So the Atlanta Braves, the Texas Rangers, Seattle Mariners, Cincinnati, Cleveland. Um, we have a, a one-week window where everybody gets notified as to who's available. And then beginning on Monday uh, at midnight, you can reach out to those teams. So literally Sunday at 12.01, my phone rang, uh, our owner's phone rang, and teams started calling to try to position themselves to get into the Yeah, you guys Beach. were in high demand. Yes. And it ended up being the Cubs, which has just worked out terrific. Yeah, it, it couldn't have been better. And uh, the Cubs not, uh, bring a, a handful of things to the table. At the time, their farm system was ranked number one in minor league baseball. Uh, a lot of those prospects are in the big leagues now. Well, it's not a coincidence that, you know, you, since you've been with the Cubs, they've won the Carolina League twice in a row. Yeah, we've won the Carolina League twice in a row. We're, we're on the cusp of m- making the playoffs again this year. Um, and um, you, you've got a national brand. You've got a great major league Just team. won the World Series. You, you're coming off a World Series. You have Cubs fans that are that are engaged and, and want to travel and can't get enough Cubs. And – and the, the deciding factor, quite frankly, for us was our role in the community is, um, is to meet the needs of the community. And the Chamber of Commerce and CVB has focused on the Chicago region as their number one target for tourism growth in the market. So as a Cubs affiliate, we're able to leverage. We generated last year, we subscribed to Meltwater. We've generated uh, almost $15 million worth of media coverage um, around the country. Number one, of course, was in South Carolina, where we get a lot of coverage. But number two was in the state of Illinois, where we generated over $3.5 million in media value for the community to market, promote, and make Myrtle Beach top of mind. So let's talk about uh, maybe we have some wealthy people that are listening to this podcast and they're thinking about maybe getting a minor league team as a business, which may or may not be a good idea. Give me a ballpark. You don't have to necessarily have to tell me how much the Pelicans are worth, but give me a ballpark about how much a minor league team goes for maybe at the single A level? So I think there, there's a couple of things that uh, that would come into play, and there's some different people that might use uh, some numbers. It, it, somebody might benchmark it and say 10 times EBITDA or something like that. Uh, ultimately, uh, just like the major league level, uh, they're worth whatever somebody will pay. And um, there's, there typically has been somebody always willing to pay more than what somebody bought it for, especially at the major league level, NFL level, as the media rights and everything have have really changed the game. And and even though the media viewership at the big league level sometimes um, it is challenging and those numbers aren't as easy to keep up, as the media world is fragmented, the fact that you have something that people tune into live and on a regular basis adds even more value to the sports landscape and the sports properties. But at our level, You would see a single-A franchise, low-A or high-A, probably sell in the neighborhood of $10 million to $16 million. Um, And a lot of that depends on the market, the lease, the ballpark that you're in, um, the affiliation, the part of the country that you're in. And, um, you know, the franchise, the business is a great business. It's not necessarily something you're going to get rich in overnight. it's, It's more of a value play. Um, you, you hopefully are doing well and make distributions on an ongoing basis. And actually, that, that actually brings up, I for, forgot to mention, you know, the, the, the Pelicans are blessed with a pretty good ballpark um, that I think is about 15 years old, right? I mean, uh, it's... We're, we're in our 19th season. 19th season, okay. So, but that you don't own the ballpark. I mean, that you lease that from the city, right? The city owns Am I right? The county owns it? Yeah, so the, when they built the ballpark, the county paid 30%, the city paid 70%, and it's jointly owned by the two. But the city operates it, maintains it, and that's who our lease is with. Okay. So I want to I wanna just sort of relax a little bit and talk about some of the... It, one of the things that people love when they go to minor league games is all the crazy promotions and all the goofy stuff that goes on. So I want to tell you, on my desk at home, I have a bobble finger <laughs> from, <laughs> from the Prostate Cancer <laughs> Awareness Night. And I think, honestly, I think this made national headlines, but like, didn't somebody get like a prostate exam in the press box or something like that? Yes, that, that was me. That will be on my tombstone <laughs> and read it my obituary. Uh, I, I have not... Uh, I have not... Spoken or been introduced at an event or function uh, 
in, since that time where that has not that been has brought not, up yeah. uh, in Actually, the introduction and I was during not, the Q&A. I was not there for that. <laughs> I think I think, uh, I think my mom was at the game and she got the bobble finger and she gave it to me, but that was legendary. Yeah. It's absolutely legendary. I think that's brilliant. So the, the interesting thing about that is, um, you know, I was on, on WRNN radio doing a, a weekly show that I do on Wednesdays and we had talked about Men's Health Awareness Night. And they jokingly said something about um, getting a, a colonoscopy a colonoscopy uh, at home plate. And I said, uh, no, uh, didn't Katie Quirk or somebody already do something like that? And um, I went back to the, this was on a Wednesday. Our promotion was the following Thursday, so eight days later. I went back to the office and I said, they threw out an idea. I'm not sure we can pull it off or not. <laughs> I said, but if, if you guys can figure out a way that keeps us above criticism <laughs> and and does right from a community standpoint. Well, I mean, was there any criticism? Th- th- there wasn't any. I-, right. I think I had one person reach out and say, what are you doing? <laughs> you can't do this on the field in front of kids. But but we didn't. <laughs> and so we we talked over how to do it. And um, there's a young girl here in town, Fallon Emery, uh, my wife's uh, best friend's daughter, who's been battling uh, glioblastoma for the last two and a half years now. Um, wasn't supposed to make it 18 months. And we were holding a fundraiser for them. And ultimately, we said, look, if we can get her Facebook page from 6,000 likes to 10,000, uh, I'll do it. And so that became the crux of it, because if we could get her, if we could promote her, it would help us generate attendance and get people to come to the game two weeks later when we were going to be hosting an event to raise money for her. And um, I got a phone call. I got a, there was a, tech, a tweet that went out Saturday night from Darren Ravel. On Sunday morning, I got a direct message in my inbox from Darren asking me if this was for real, and if so, would I send him my cell phone number? So on Sunday morning, I was making breakfast for my wife and kids. My phone rings, and it's Darren Ravel. My wife looks at me thinking it's my boss calling and gives me a disgusting look. She takes over the the dinner, the breakfast uh, making responsibilities, and I go out for 15 minutes in the driveway and have a conversation. I came back in, sat down to my cold eggs and toast, and five minutes later, Darren Ravel's on ESPN talking about our promotion. Oh, wow. And in the next week, I did interviews all over the country. It was covered in the BBC. It was covered in Canada. I did radio shows in San Diego. I didn't know it was that big. I had no idea. St. Pete, Detroit, D.C. Well, I'm definitely not getting rid of the bobble finger. Um, I'm I'm definitely hanging on to that. It it was amazing. And, uh, you know, it was... uh, it was it was a surreal experience. Now we had to find a doctor that was willing to yeah, do of course. this. Um, and so we did it while I'm singing "Take Me Out to the Ball Game." Uh, and and the point of it was to uh, to to show people that prostate cancer is 98 percent curable if detected early. And the only thing that prevents that is people not getting a PSA test or or fear of the digital exam. And it's it's not a big deal. Um, and, and the point was to demonstrate that. And what we said is if we can allow one more child to play catch with his father result, as a result of relieving this stigma, yeah, for sure. we will have made a difference. And, well, that, and that's where I think baseball and sports has the power to, to really change the world because of the way we can engage people. I'm, I'm not afraid of the exam. I'm, I can handle <laughs> it. So let's talk about some of the really good players that have come through sure. over the last couple of years. So speaking of promotions, you had a smells of the ballpark, I think a couple of years ago with Runia Dodor. Yes. And this is when it was the, the Rangers franchise, and obviously he's playing for the Rangers now. And he's a really good ball player, but I think he's most famous for punching out Jose Bautista. I, I think, think so. I think that's going to be on YouTube for like 20 years. Um, some of the other ones I remembered was Odubel Herrera, who's having a pretty good uh, career with the Phillies. Yes. Uh, playing center field, um, which I would not have predicted. Um, Joey Gallo, but I, I think everybody predicted that. Um, I was also thinking of Kyle Hendricks, of course, yes. who did great in the World Series. Uh, who else has come through? Uh, well, from the World Series team, we had Kyle Hendricks, Jason Hayward, and Justin Grimm with the Cubs, who all came through Myrtle Beach. Well, Hay- Hayward, I mean, years ago. Yeah, ironically, none of whom came through as a Cub, came through as Rangers or Braves. Or Braves. Yep. Um, we've had uh, Raphael Furcal is up, uh, you know, had an unbelievable career. Uh, that came through here. I think we're up to 160 different big league players that have come through Myrtle Beach and and made the big leagues in our 18 plus seasons. All right, so let's take a short commercial break. I just want to let you guys know, if you're interested in reading my stuff, a good starting point is the 10th Man newsletter published by Malden Economics, and it's absolutely free. 
Free isn't free, as in it doesn't cost anything. The name of the newsletter actually comes from World War Z. To sign up, all you have to do is go to www.tenthman.us. That's www.tenthman.us. That's 10th as in number 10. It's a good introduction to how I think about markets, and there's plenty of funny stuff in there, too. Just go to www.tenthman.us. All right, so now we're just going to goof around here. We're just going to talk about funny stuff. So, uh, what, you know, with my wife and I, one of the biggest attractions for us is the mascots. So, obviously, you have Splash, the pelican. Yes. And you have Rally Shark. By the way, Rally Shark, is his costume is getting a little old. <laughs> and the head, like, I don't think you can, like, dry clean the head. The head is kind of dirty, but, yes. like, the rest of him looks pretty good. You know, uh, I think there was there was a Rally Shark a couple years ago who did, like, lots of somersaults in the dirt. He just kept getting dirty. Yeah, he but, had a baby, uh, so that's why we lost oh, him. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, before you, there were two other mascots. Maybe they were before you. I don't know. There was El Bad Guy. Do you remember that? Do you remember that, was, that one? That was before that me. That was before you. They had this... Like Nacho Libre, like Mexican wrestler, <laughs> um, and uh, and and really like long ago, back when it was the Braves, they had uh, Luby, and they had a partnership with Jiffy Lube, and literally Luby was like a guy in. Like, his head was like a drop of oil. And I got to tell you, this was like the funniest dude I've ever seen. And I just wanted I just wanted, I just wanted, to ask about those two because if you still had the costumes laying around the stadium somewhere, I wanted to pick them up for Halloween or something like that. <laughs> we, we do not, to my knowledge. Ironically, uh, so Rally Shark got introduced um, as, a, as a mascot that would come out only when we were trailing in the ninth inning. And um, we paid... Before I got here, they paid $300 for a costume online that I think got shipped over from China. And the costume that is worn. Uh, and um, we said after last season, we, we need a new rally shark. So they went <laughs> back online, ordered another costume. It came in um, before the season. And we looked at it, and we said, this does not Doesn't meet work. our standards. We cannot send anybody out in this So you costume. still got the old costume. So we, we have ordered a new one, but it... it, it a traditional mascot costume will cost you anywhere from six thousand dollars to as much as twenty, um, and uh, obviously they don't come off of the rack; they're custom built. And um, Dave Raymond, who's a really good friend of mine and created the Philly Fanatic, he was the original Philly Fanatic. Um, he helps develop, cultivate, teach, recruit, and, and create mascot programming and costumes. And um, it, it, a lot goes into ordering a mascot costume, and apparently you just can't find one off the shelf like you used to be. Yeah, ordered off of ago. Alibaba or something like <laughs> yes. that. Yes. So let's talk about Deuce, the team dog. Now, Deuce, Deuce has been around for a long time. Deuce has been around all seven years I've been there, so he must be getting pretty old by now. Yeah, in fact, uh, I'm not 100% sure, but I think this offseason we're going to be looking into uh, Deuce's re- replacement as he uh, moves it's gonna off to retire, retirement. Huh? Yeah, He's going to get retired. He's going to retire. Uh, it's fairly taxing, not just the running out with the balls and running the bases post game, but he's on for three hours in the pro shop, and fans are taking pictures and petting him and so forth. Yep. And uh, I think Deuce is now 10 years old, so he's he's getting up there. And, so, I, uh, so I didn't even explain. So Deuce, he's a, he's a yellow lab, right? Yes. And he... Um, so twice during the game, he'll he'll get like a little basket with baseballs and he'll bring them out to the umpire. And it's actually pretty comical because his success ratio is maybe one in three or one in four. Usually he drops it halfway or screws it up somehow, which is funny. And actually, one of the other funny parts of it is depending on who the umpire is, they are either cool with it or not cool with it. It's really interesting to watch. Like some umpires refuse to bend over and pick up the balls. Like the ball boy has to bring it to him. And the other, and some umpires are like, they like deuce, you know, they want to pet him and like they pick up the balls. Yeah. I mean, set aside your, your political thoughts, but, uh, the, the attitudes of umpires have changed a little bit since uh, they formed a union. <laughs> and they used to be more than happy to pick up the balls. Yeah. But about six years ago, actually, they, for, they formed an umpires union. And, you know, those guys are just young kids like ours. They're 21, yeah, they're 22 yeah. years old. Uh, uh, as rough as the travel schedule is for our guys, um, playing 70 games at home and 70 on the road, those umpires have 140 games all on the road. And they have to drive themselves. They don't get a bus to take them. Oh, that's tough. So it, it is a really tough gig, the umpires, and, and sometimes it's tough to no get sense them of humor. to embrace what we're doing, and they can take themselves a little too seriously as a result. So one of my one of my favorite do stories is when he had to take a dump in the outfield. <laughs> and, and and for anybody who's who's uh, listening, 
You can actually see this online. Just go and search for Deuce lives up to his name again. And it's, it's on, it, you can, you can get the video online and it is, it is one of the funniest things I've ever seen. The crowd was going nuts. Yeah, that's happened, uh, to my knowledge, that's happened here one time. It's happened at a couple of other ballparks, and and I that happened before I got here. But I did see it one time we had a... So is there anything you can do about it, or you just kind of figure if it happens, it happens? No, like, if I mean, it happens, it happens. And, and honestly, I mean, if there was a way sure to make that happen once a week, I would do it, just because the it would end up on every Facebook page that you you could imagine. It's uh, the, the crowd loves that type of thing, and I oh, saw yeah. it happen with a Frisbee dog one time that we had in, and... Uh, the, just just the same thing in Erie, Pennsylvania. The crowd went ballistic. Yeah. Um, so now, you know, I, I, I mentioned we have um, sort, of, sort of this ticket package. About three or four years ago, we were sitting next to a very interesting character who had season tickets like right next to us. And he was the owner of the dollhouse strip club. <laughs> And um, I got to tell you, just put aside whatever preconceptions you might have about a guy who owns a strip club. He was really one of the nicest guys I have ever met in my entire life. But it was funny because he used to bring his employees to the game. (laughs) And, you know, they're not baseball fans. A lot of these girls are from, like, Eastern Europe or something like that. So after about the second inning, they would, like, go wander off and start handing out business cards. So... I just was, you know, I've always been curious to know what it's, I'm sure you guys were aware that he was there and this was going on and any discussions you had about, you know, what you were going to do about this. Yeah. So, uh, they, they've had season tickets and done sweet nights and things like that for a number of years. They have approached us about sponsorships, which we have uh, declined to participate in. Uh, they've been creative in kind of how they have, um, wanted to position the sponsorship so that even if it's uh, just something that appeals to players uh, and not directed at fans. And, and at the end of the day, it's just, it's not consistent with, with our brand and what it. minor league baseball yeah, stands for. It. Um, and, but at the same time, obviously if they want to buy season tickets, they're welcome to, and they can bring whoever they would like. And I did have to address an issue one time with our, uh, with our, our interns who selected our candidates for the, the, uh, medieval times game where they ride the inflatable I horses that. i saw that and uh that two was, of his guests were out there in dollhouse t-shirts that was had to in, be uh, that was intense yeah i was there for that i mean like a hush fell over the crowd yeah, yeah. nobody knew what to make of it <laughs> except me uh and uh and soon soon thereafter the employee that thought that that was a good idea so 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 you have a couple of other promotions you have thirsty thursday yes. which i've always wanted to talk about because um, there's a there's a there's a great baseball book called Seasons in Hell about the 1974 Texas Rangers, which is I mean it is one of the funniest books I have ever read in my entire life. But it talks about the um, the end of alcohol related promotions for Major League Baseball. So the Milwaukee Brewers used to have Nickel Beer Night, and this was back in the 70s. And uh, one time Nickel Beer Night got out of hand, and Everybody got naked and ran onto the field. And, I mean, it was, it was insane. So they had to, that was the end of alcohol-related promotions. But I guess you can still do it at the minor league level. And I know that Thirsty Thursday is, you know, one of the most popular nights of the week. So I'm just trying to, you know, I know that you serve the dollar beers in those little cups, and it's like Bud Light and stuff like that. But, you know, from a management standpoint, do you have any problems with anything getting out of hand or... Well, there are uh, significantly more arrests and uh, ejections on a Thursday versus the other six days of the year. Not that there are a ton, um, but if when we do have issues, um, typically they would be on a Thursday. But there there aren't many. Um, generally, we wristband everybody. We have a we have a really good staff, not only in the concession stands, but in terms of ushers and ticket takers and security that's there on those nights. And we do it from six to eight. There's some teams that do it through the seventh inning. Um, the six to eight rule is because of the uh, the alcohol laws in the state of South Carolina. So it, it does help us manage it a little bit because the, the sales are cut off and it goes back to normal prices before people start uh, getting getting uh, too, too far overboard. Now, you also have Wiener Wednesday. And I got to tell you, Wiener Wednesday, it motivated me to try – to enter a hot dog eating contest, <laughs> and and I practiced on uh, on your dogs, uh, on you know dollar dog night. This is now, <laughs> now it's like now it's two for one hot dogs, but for a while it was dollar dogs. Yeah, and uh, 
I, I got I, I got nine down and I was done. That was all I could do. And I decided I was not cut out for a hot dog eating contest. I mean, I think nine is pretty good, but it's you know it's yeah, not going to cut it. Nine is terribly impressive. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't think you should do that to yourself. I imagine you probably <laughs> didn't feel right for a couple of days. And you know we have Hebrew National hot dogs. They're they're great, all beef, no nitrates. So it's as good of a hot dog as you're going to find. And and that's a great promotion. And what we what we try to do really, whether it's make a splash Monday, which is now Backpack Buddy Monday. Um, where you get high, half price tickets for donating items to backpack buddies, or it's Thursdays with dollar beers and fireworks, or it's Sunday family days, is try to create programming that's going to appeal to different segments of the population. Um, if you go to a major league game, you're either a diehard baseball fan or you're being entertained by somebody who's, who's making an investment in, in entertaining you. And um, for us, we have an opportunity to bring kids and families and people out to the ballpark who aren't diehard baseball fans introduce them to the game and, and hopefully develop them into baseball fans and kind of keep people engaged in this in this sport and in this industry. So at the end of every podcast, uh, I do a speed round. And so what I'm going to do Ooh. is I'm going to give you a choice between two things, A or B, and you have to pick one. All okay. Right. And since this is a baseball podcast, we're going to do all baseball-related stuff. Okay. So the first one is... Aaron Judge or Giancarlo Stanton? Ooh, uh, I, I think Aaron Judge. If you can do what he's doing in New York at this age, I think you can do anything. It's not just his size or his power. It's his makeup. The guy is like, he's got the whole package. He's got the whole package. Yeah, it's, it's insane. Yeah. Um, Chris Sale or Randy Johnson? Ooh, um... It's hard to argue with Chris Sale and the performance that he puts up there day in and day out, but uh, I just don't know how you turn your back on a 6'10 left-hander that throws 98-99. I, I think i go Randy Johnson. Yeah, and he, he also, I mean, you know, Chris Sale is, is terrific, but Randy Johnson did that over a 20-year career, you know, so yeah, lots and, of, he was consistent for a long time. And as a guy who sometimes asks his players and coaches to wear uniforms in the spirit of a promotion uh, – the fact that he refused and led the revolt on that uh, doesn't sit well with oh, me. Oh, man. I, actually, I don't know. I kind of agree with him on that. All right, let's do announcers. Jessica Mendoza or Aaron Boone? Ooh, I, I like Jessica Mendoza. I like her a lot. Yeah, she's great. And, I mean, I, I like Aaron Boone because he blew up the Red Sox in 2003. But I think Jessica Mendoza is a better announcer. She, she's a fantastic announcer i'm not i don't like her as much in the one-on-one interview stuff um i feel it's less about baseball and it turns into kind of a flirty session it seems like but uh when it comes to play-by-play and doing color she's fantastic all right one last one gms and i'm gonna give you two two bad ones at least at least recently (laughs) brian cashman or billy bean Ooh. um I mean, Billy Bean is legendary, but he's, I mean, he's put up, I mean, the last 10 years, he's got nothing. And, um, you know, Cashman has managed to do a little with a lot of money for a long time. I mean, it's, it's kind of like two dump trucks colliding. Yeah. I, I mean, on, on the one hand, Cashman, to deal with the ownership that he's dealt with, deal with the pressures of being in New York. That is a good is, point. Is really, really impressive. And, um, you know, it, it, it's unbelievable to me that uh, Billy Bean um, could really revolutionize the way people think about talent and building a roster and, and, you know, looking for value and undervalued resources. You know, that's applicable to what you do, what I do, what everybody in the world does, looking for upside. Um, but uh, I think I would go Cashman. Cashman. You know, actually, I have a little insight into that. We, they offered, I mean, so many people that GM job under Steinbrenner, and nobody would take it. He was the only guy that would take it. He was in his early 30s, you know, and, and that's, that's why they went with him. And, I mean, not to take away from Billy Bean, I mean, you know, that whole story with the Oakland A's is great, but they've had a terrible run the last few years. So, Yeah, I, I think um, what Cashman has been able to do under Steinbrenner, and granted, they can spend money. Uh, like nobody can, but there's not very many teams that have had success buying their way to championships. And and even when they have gotten older veterans that are with, have inflated contracts and the payroll has been bloated, he's been able 
to, to manage those contracts, to pivot, to get young, and to get it back under control and get them this, back on track very quickly.